feel like you're back in medieval days. <laughs> Hope we don't wreck any of the decor here. Good thing I'm preaching tonight, not John. He's going to be walking around and knocking stuff over, I'm afraid. <laughs> Welcome to worship. We come into God's presence on this uh, day of rest and worship to give Him our praise. Psalm 4 calls us to worship. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's unite our hearts in a, in a prayer of intercession, asking God to bless our time together. Father in heaven, we come into your presence because you are the God of grace, the God who allows us to lie down in peace, to sleep, the sleep of the righteous, not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ. And as we think about the rain that refreshed the ground and gave us greater prospects for a good harvest, we continue to say, but what you give us gives us greater joy than a lot of corn and a lot of beans. And so, Father, we pray that our focus may be on you, what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Receive our worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand. We'll sing the words of number 428. I'll worship the King all glorious above. We'll gratefully sing His power and His love. Let's sing the five stanzas of that number. So it is that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of His Spirit. Let's receive His greeting. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and presence of His Holy Spirit. Amen. 
As God has greeted us, let's turn and welcome and greet one another to this place and time of worship. You may be seated. If you've been following the uh, today, this month, from the Back to God Hour, your family devotions, it's, it's all about Sabbath, Sunday, why God set this day aside for us to worship. One of the uh, Psalms expresses the need for a Sunday, a time to gather in God's presence. It, sets it says it about as clearly as it can. I would like to read Psalm 73 with you, and I will respond to that, that, song by, uh, that psalm by singing the words of that psalm. Psalm 73. It's on page 541 if you wish to follow. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my footing, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. The evil conceits of their mind know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always careless. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, in, in vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued, I have been punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak this, thus I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin, how quickly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakens, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant, I was like a beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me in your right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And being on earth, I desire nothing. And being with you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds." Sunday is good, a blessing. Let's sing together the words of that psalm, number 73, from our hymn books, God Loves All the Righteous. Some of the verses we will sing.
I would invite you to turn to Genesis 22, page 18, Genesis 22, and then we'll also read a text from Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to uh, continue our tour of the gallery, the gallery of faith the Old Testament people who lived by faith. Last time we looked at Abram's story of laughter. He and Sarah laughed at the promise of God. Tonight we want to look at the testing that Abram went through, the testing of his faith. We'll do this just a little bit different. It'll be, I trust, Abram's story in his own words. Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abram and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of, Mount, of, Mount, of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abram got up, saddled his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to, for the place God told him about. On the third day, Abram looked up and saw the place in a distance, said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abram replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abram answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abram built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay your hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God and because you have not withheld your, from me your son, your only son. Abram looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abram called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Thus far, may God bless his word. And our, our guide in the, in the gallery gives us this commentary on Abram's faith. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered sac Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Thus far, may God bless His Word. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when do we know that our faith is genuine? That it's real faith? That it, that it can stand the test? Do we prove the genuineness of our faith when we stand up in a body of like-minded people and say words like, found in, like are found in the Apostles' Creed? Is, is the proof of our faith heard in, in words we say, I, I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Is it a proving of our faith when we do things that we are trained to do? Things traditional to our religious heritage, praying at meals, going to church, giving money for missions? I'm sure we can correctly say that all of these that we can call all of these things the practice of our faith. 
But are they, they the only proof of our faith? When and where is faith proven to be real and genuine? If you're willing, would you listen to Abraham tell his story about the time when his faith was tested and proven to be genuine? Thankfully, by the grace of God, we do not all have to prove the reality of our faith in quite the same way that Abraham's faith was tested. And yet I suspect, and maybe this is saying more than we really know, that Abraham's faith was tested in a representative way for all who are his children in the covenant of grace, all who follow him and live by faith. And yet we, His children in the covenant of grace, ought not to dismiss those, those faith-proving, the faith-proving value of our hard times, our diseases, our positive tests, our hospital stays, our, our financial hard times. Do we look at the fires that we go through as testing faith, refining the direction of our trust, the quality of our trust, break, burning off the impurities, of our faith. So let's stop as in our tour of the gallery of Old Testament saints to hear the continuation of Abraham's story. Let me tell you Abraham's story of his testing in his own words. We'll use our imagination a bit, but may God help us so that what we imagine happened, what we imagine matches what really went on in Abraham's life. So we push the button and the story begins to be told. With the birth of Isaac, life settled down for Sarah and myself. You recall the hard time that we had with the promise of God that we two old people would have a son? You remember how we each laughed at God's promise? But what would you expect from an old couple of 99 and 89 years old? If we had not, had not had any children in our younger years when we were able, how can, how can one imagine that in our old age we'd have a son? But we learned in, the whole, in this whole matter that the issue was really not our inability or our age. The issue was God's ability and God's power. We, he can do what He promised, even if it seems preposterous to us. I'll never forget the time when we heard the words of that angel there by the tent after Sarah was, was heard laughing. It was almost with a bit of pain in his voice that the angel said to us, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now Sarah and I have learned to say, no, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Well, time passed. We had the son. Isaac is now 17 years old. Strapping lad, somewhat timid and shy. Maybe Sarah and I spoiled him a bit in our old age. We did dote on him. We tried to be as good a parents as we could, given our age. After all, I'm 117. Sarah is 107. Don't get around like we once did. Tough keeping, keeping up with that lad. But the peace of our little household was shattered on the night, a night I will never forget. I was lying in my tent on the sheepskin mat, sleeping peacefully, when a vision grabbed my subconscious mind and I, I heard God speak. I knew it was His voice. I'd heard it before. I heard it clearly now. Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. I sat up in my bed like I'd been struck by lightning, broke into a cold sweat. I knew it was the voice of God. 
I knew he had just given me a command, but, but I didn't know what to make of it. Sacrifice my son whom I love, Isaac, after all that went into bringing him into this, into this earth and into our lives and, and into that covenant context. At first, there was almost a, a sense of bitterness. Why? Why Isaac? I could, have, I could have shouted back to heaven, why don't you give your son whom you love if you need a sacrifice so badly? But I didn't. What really hit me was how strange this request was. I'd seen sacrifices before. I'd made some sacrifices myself. I'd even seen people sacrifice their children back to some pagan god back in the old country. But, but this, this god had never asked for a sacrifice before. He, he never hinted that he needed this kind of sacrifice of a human child. He never made it a part of this covenant contract. Was this the God who had called me out of my home and my family? Who had promised to make of me a great nation? Who had given me this son that I loved? Was this God actually any different from the pagan gods? Does does he need my son to make some kind of sacrifice of atonement for Sarah and I and because of our laughter or doubts? Is this why he gave us this son? But then, but then this God is not like the pagan gods. He never asked that I go on a search for him to try to find him. He never asked that I make sacrifices to somehow curry his favor. He always came to me. He always spoke to me first. He made those promises to me and and, and Sarah. He he promised the son in our old age. But then another problem hit me. This command makes no sense. Absolutely no sense. The covenant promise and this command to sacrifice my son stand diametrically opposed to each other. My troubled mind Remember distinctly the promises of this God. He said, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make you great. I will make you a blessing to all the nations of the world. To your descendants I will give this land. I will make your descendants as many as the stars of the sky in number. But it all had to begin with a son. A son out of my own body, he said. Sarah's son. Am I now supposed to sacrifice that son? I almost shouted back to heaven, God, I have to have this son for those promises to be fulfilled. God, you have to have this son in order to do as you promised. We both need Isaac. We need him alive. There's no clause in that covenant contract that that demands a sacrifice of my son, the son I love and have waited so long for. By the way, I, I do know now that there was a clause in the covenant contract that God made with me, a clause I really didn't know about yet, but a clause that would demand the sacrifice of the son that God loved. But that night on my mat, I was in turmoil. This was a request of my God, my covenant God, that made absolutely no sense. So what could I do? It was like I was facing a wall and there was no way up, no way under, no way around. All questions, no answers. It's like I was hemmed in. But suddenly, as if by inspiration, it dawned on me. I saw that the way of escape would have to come from above. It dawned on me that God is creating a problem not just for me. He's creating a problem for himself. It's his covenant and his covenant promises that are at stake here. He needs Isaac as much as I do. 
all I've ever been asked is to, to do is to, to follow Him in faith, believing His Word. Can it be any different now? This is all about faith, isn't it? It's all about trust. It's all about living in reverent fear of the promises of this God. I think I need Isaac. I love Isaac. He's my son. But you know what? I need God more. I love God. Isaac by himself is not going to bring about the fulfillment of these covenant promises even though he's vital to the plan. God will. I can't pretend to know how this is going to turn out. But then I really don't need to know either. I must simply let go and let God. This is a test by which my faith is being tried. I have to let go and let God solve the problem that He created for Himself. It's not for me to determine how this is going to turn out for good. I have to believe that God will bring about good, even if He has to raise my son from the dead. I remember the words of quite a few years ago. Is anything too hard for the Lord? So with that decision to let go and let God, I slept for a few more hours, got up, roused Isaac from his bed, got some servants out of bed, gathered some wood, gathered some fire-making material, collected some wood, saddled some donkeys, loaded the supplies on them, and we set out for the territory of Moriah. I tried to be an example of stoic faith for those three days it took to, march, or to move toward Moriah, but inwardly, inwardly I wrestled. It's not easy, you know, to let go and let God. I firmly believed that God would solve the problem that He had created, but I couldn't help wondering how. Would I be aware of God's intervention? Would I see it when and where it happened? Sensing that this, this time with my son would have to be a very private affair, I asked my servants to stay in a place while I and Isaac walked on up to the mountain. A very painful moment came when my son asked a question, a heart-rending question that I knew was coming. Dad, you got the fire-making material and we got the wood. Where's the lamb of sacrifice? I guess I was saying more than I really knew when I answered with a tremble in my voice, my son, God will provide the lamb. And I didn't yet know just how prophetic that statement would be. Finally and all too quickly we got to the place where the sacrifice had been to be made. Together and quietly we built an altar, laying the wood in place. And I took the rope and I began to tie the strong young arms of my son. Oh, how hard it was to let go and let God. Thankfully, he, did, he, he seemed to sense that he was the sacrifice because he didn't fight me as he surely could and I wouldn't have been able to handle him. Tied his arms, laid him on the altar, reached for the knife. Any time now, God... Any time, I lifted the knife ready to plunge it into my son. But then a voice, the voice of an angel broke into that very solemn moment. Abram, don't slay your son. I know that you fear me. God solved the problem. I threw the knife away. I loosened the ropes off the arms of my son and held him to me. And that's when I saw that, that ram caught in the thicket. I sent Isaac to get him and he brought him back and we, we killed it and sacrificed it. God had in fact provided the lamb for burnt offering as later he would do again. 
Well, that's the end of Abram's story, except for the commentary made by our guide in, in the gallery. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abram reasoned that God would raise the dead, could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. So, people of God, we come back to our original question, when and where is faith proven to be genuine? While we do not discount the value of reciting our faith with words in the friendly confines of the church with fellow believers, while it is important for us that we do the things that, that our faith tradition calls us to, while it is evidence of faith that we continue to sing and pray and read the Bibles at our tables, we do not discount the value of testing for the measurement of our faith. Words in a safe place are easy. Things we do by habit are, are, are seldom threatening. It's when the medical report comes back positive for cancer. It's when we're told by the medical community that there's nothing more that they can do. It's when we stand by the graves of our mates and our loved ones. It's when we have to forgive someone who offended and hurt us. It's when financial resources erode. When the forces of nature spoil our crops and our possessions. When challenges come into our lives that we cannot deal with in our own strength. When we're flat on our back in a hospital bed. It's then that the quality of our trust is revealed. Can we let go and let God. Will we say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Will we let God work out all things for good? Abraham, in a, in a few words, summarized the genius of faith in the Christian life. He named the mountain where the ram replaced Isaac on the altar. He named that mountain the Lord will provide. That He did in Jesus Christ when He sent the Son He loved for the sacrifice of all our sins. That He will continue to do, provide, as He tests, tries, proves our faith. In every circumstance of life we can trust He will provide. Amen. Thank you, Father for a marvelous story of our Father in the faith. A Father who wrestled with covenant promises and covenant obligations. Who heard your voice in the middle of the night and calling Him to do something that He couldn't understand. Father, we live with many situations we can't understand either. Times in, lives, in our lives, situations in our lives that test us and try us. But Father, help us to let go, to know that You will provide. You will provide that all things do work together for good. You provide so that nothing separates us from Your love in Jesus Christ. Because among all the provisions that You have given us, the greatest of all is the Son You loved on the sacrifice, in sacrifice on the altar of the cross. And that gives us peace. Build our faith, our hope, deepen our fear and adoration of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> From the blue psalter, my faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Let's stand and sing those four stanzas together. <clears throat>
seated. Let's come to God in our pastoral prayer. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this evening and we bring you our thanks for this day, this day of rest, day of renewal, a day of recharging our batteries, a day in which we can open your word and, and, and hear you call us to faith, to trust, to trust your word, to believe your, your promises. May that be so, Father, in the lives of folks who struggle with difficulties in life, who find their faith tested, who find living life in a sinful world with all its difficulties, diseases, and problems, sometimes a hard thing. Father, we pray as members of our church go through different difficulties in life, maybe cancer treatments, broken bones, having to move from homes to places where they need to be cared for, as they go through depression, loss of, loss of spouses. Father, we pray that you, your spirit and your word will be there to keep their faith and their hope strong. They may know that your promises are good. We thank you for, that what, for what Abraham went through for us in many ways. Having his, as, as the father of, of all believers, having his faith tested to the max, but then giving us a picture of the sacrifice that you would make for us. Father, we thank you for your covenant of grace, for the promises of that covenant and for the fulfillment of those promises. And we look ahead to the day when as Revelation tells us, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And you will be our God and we will be your people. Living in a land where there will be no more pain and no more disease and no more tears and no more death. So Father, help your people to live by faith in all the struggles and trials of life. Father, again we... Rejoice with the, with the rain that you have sent to, to this part of the community to refresh our crops. We talked to folks who didn't get that much, and some got very little on the Thursday night, and we pray that you will provide for them too so that there may be a harvest, and that when the harvest comes, we may be good stewards of what you loan to us. Father, we pray for a blessing in this week that is ahead of us, that you will go with us as we go about our work, our tasks, our responsibilities. We pray, Father, that you will give us the strength to get up every morning and do the work you call us to do. Help us, Father, to be people who reflect the fact that we've sat at your feet and we've heard your word and You've called us to be people of honesty and people of integrity and people of kindness, people who love, people who serve. May our lives reflect that call. May it reflect that obedience. Father, if we find ourselves trusting too much in our money or the size of our crops or the acres of our land or the goodness of our, of our lives, may we recognize that we trust you alone for you and Jesus Christ have provided what we truly need you have provided you will continue to provide for your people father we pray for the spread of the gospel around the world bless missionaries wherever they go with that good news all the missionaries that are are, are listed in in our church directory that we support you know their names, you know their places, you know where they work, you know the challenges they face. Will you go with each one of them? Will you use them to spread the gospel? We pray for the missionaries that, that are sent out by the Christian Reformed Church, our denomination, many parts of the world. Father, we pray that you'll bless their work and that you will build your church and gather your kingdom. They will make your gospel powerful where missionaries work in dangerous places. Spare them 
where your church grows in, 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 in difficult situations, in what would seem to be unfertile ground, we pray, Father, that your church may grow to the amazement of those who watch. Father, we pray for the work of World Renew as lives are touched by those who, who minister to physical needs in different parts of the world, those who help uh, in disaster parts of our country. Again, may the testimony of Christian people at work be a means that, by which the gospel is made credible for those who observe and those who are helped. Bless the work of farmer to farmer, we pray, and the folks involved on the field and the, the board members and all the people who are helped. We pray here that here too lives may be touched and lives may be improved and, and the gospel made more real. Father, we pray for peace in your world. We pray for an end to war and, and conflict in, Af in Afghanistan and parts of Africa, in the Middle East. We pray for wise leaders. We pray for resolution of the conflicts in Syria. We pray, Father, that wise leaders may be brought to the forefront, who make good decisions, who recognize the foolishness of war and desire to live at peace. Heavenly Father, we pray for our leaders, give them wisdom to lead and govern well. So, Father, bless us as a congregation. Bless the consul that they may give wise leadership. We pray for Pastor John and Mary Jo as they minister among us. Continue to care for them and give them what they need every day as they open your word, as John presents the message to us. Father, we pray that you will bless the plans for Vacation Bible School, and we pray that here too lives may be touched, that young may hear the good news and pass it on to parents. So, Father, we pray bless all of those involved, all the volunteers. We pray, Father, this may be a, an enterprise of community outreach that receives your blessing. Provide what we need this week. Keep us in your care. Keep us in your grace. Help us to recognize how we've been blessed and then resolve to be a blessing. How we've been served so that we too may serve. Receive our gifts for the work of missions. Multiply these gifts for the building of your church and kingdom. Receive our worship. Forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our offering for uh, missions and evangelism outreach will now be received.
Let's now stand and recite some words of faith in the safe place of the church building. From our world belongs to God, Articles 24, 27, 28. We say together, God remembered his promise to reconcile the world to himself. He has come among us in Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh. He is the long-awaited Savior, truly human and wholly divine, conceived by the Holy God and born of the Virgin Mary. As a substitute, we suffer all us years on earth, especially in the horrible torture of the cross. He carried God's judgment on our sin. His sacrifice removes our guilt. He walked out of the grave, the Lord of life. He conquered sin and death. He has set by God. We are given new life and are called to walk with him in freedom from sin's dominion. Being fully God and man, Jesus is the mediator between God and his people. He alone paid the debt of our sin. There is no other savior. In him, the Father chose those whom he would save. His electing love sustains our hope. God's grace is free to save sinners who offer nothing but their need for mercy. Our song forever shall record verses 1 and 2, and then we'll see the benediction, then we'll sing stanza 5. Receive God's parting blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.